All right, well, it looks like it's the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, as you're looking around, I'm going to be changing the view on you a little bit as we go through things here, but note that you may use your tools to move around your video and the chat. It's, it's all movable and you won't break anything, I promise. I can't say the same for me. I might break something, but we'll, we'll do our best. So everyone here who's joining us, uh, this is our very first um, international, intentionally, an international StarNet webinar. And so I'd love for you to, to jump on the chat. So again, that's just floating your mouse down until a little uh, toolbar pops up and you can click on chat and uh, enter in there uh, under share with all, enter in and see, and just put in your name or some sort of pseudonym. We are gonna record this and put it online. So if you're uh, not wanting your name shared, then please don't include that there. But um, just tell me, tell us all what you see outside your library window, because uh, your city or town may not have meaning to everyone with such different uh, geographies. So please just tell us, what do you see when you look out your library window? Is it, uh, 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 you know, are you surrounded by fields? Are you surrounded by a major metro, metro area? What do you see when you look outside? So I'm seeing a lot of urban environments. <laughs> Nikki sees a hardware shop, the old fashioned kind, I love it. Hey, Sonia. So you've got a nice view of a small park. All right, so keep, please do keep introducing yourselves and um, give us a hint if you're in the US or uh, like me calling in from the UK. And let me go ahead and introduce myself now while you keep introducing yourselves. Welcome to our webinar here today, Playful Hands-On STEM Learning um, in UK Libraries. And I am um, calling in to, to all of you from the University of Edinburgh in Edinburgh, Scotland, where I've been spending the last few months. And I am here because of the Fulbright program, which has allowed me to explore two different countries, um, Australia and the United Kingdom. And um, very much looking forward to sharing with you uh, some, of the, some of the things I've gotten to see in libraries and just help share with you. And I really hope that you'll share back with us please do keep active in that chat so that we can um, keep connecting on things that um, as, they, as we go through the discussions here today. And I'm um, gonna be uh, also touching on collaborations. And so I wanted to just give a big shout out already. I absolutely know what you all go through when you have to go um, knock on doors and call and email people in order to do things together. And uh, I definitely would not be here without the University of Edinburgh hosting me here and the University of South Australia hosting me in uh, 2018 to, to learn about Australian libraries. So big shout out to um, my collaborators as well as the Fulbright program. And for those of you who haven't ever heard of it, please do check out the URL and the social media links I have on here so that you can see um, all the amazing opportunities that are available to both um, residents of the UK and the US to be able to visit between our two countries. I'm also here representing a, a network in the United States, which is also all due to collaborations, namely our 8,500 library staff who take part in our network. And so thank you, all of you who make it possible. And we are um, a, a collaboration of different um, partner organizations, including ALA and other organizations that help us gather resources and provide uh, training to library professionals. 
and we're funded by NASA, the National Science Foundation, and the um, Institute for Museum and Library Services. So we'd love for, to share all of these resources for you with all of you as well and invite you to comment through our network. So I'll come back to that more in a bit. But first of all, I want to take you through this acronym of STEM. I heard so many conversations over the last couple of years of how this acronym is a little bit troublesome. What do you do with this? It's certainly present in um, education initiatives, policy, uh, the economy is very focused on STEM careers in particular. So what do we all do with this um, acronym? So jump into the, to the chat if you're feeling like, wow, I really, I really get it, I know what that means to me, or if you're feeling like, uh, yes, I don't know what to do with those, those letters. And we're gonna go into this alphabet soup a little bit today and see if we can make something meaningful for um, uh, library customers out of it. Uh, you may also be thinking as we're talking, what about the arts? And uh, so we've got, got a version here too where we can explicitly acknowledge that everything we're gonna, gonna do today is at the heart of it, creative and we want to keep it that way. So let's, uh, let's keep that in mind. And you may also like to include connections to literacy. And so that R for reading might also be important to you in there to make that acronym stream. Whatever it is that, that makes sense for you and for your community, I fully acknowledge that here in this webinar. But want to just make sure we're thinking about, you know, there's this acronym, but really at the end of the day, it's the the people in our communities that we're trying to serve and how best can we do that. So I've got a few different points for us to start bringing um, some ideas and some resources together and we'll, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we continue to go along. Um, please do keep chatting um, to all, all attendees as you're going along so that I can see your comments as I am um, running different technology here. So keep it up everybody. And I'm going to start off with that letter S, uh, which is, of course, for science. And what I'm going to dig into that a little bit and think about what kind of activities would be a science activity. And really, at the end of the day, what a scientist might be hoping uh, 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 someone comes away thinking about science is that they're thinking, oh, that makes me wonder about blank. And just instilling that curiosity so that someone can go further and wonder something new, something else, come up with their own questions and next steps. And I wanted to give you an example of an activity, which uh, is a, already an international collaboration. It's something that was used in uh, libraries here in Edinburgh with as a partnership between the Edinburgh Libraries and the Strathside University. And it's been a, a great collaboration already there, but it involves an activity that's derived from a network in the United States called NISNET, and it's called Smelly Balloons. And so I wanted to give you a sense of what that activity is by first heading over to our clearinghouse, which is where you can access not only the activity, but also a how-to video and other resources to help you implement it. So I'm gonna do something funny here with your screen and make that all go away. Uh, so bear with me. I don't know if I said my name, everyone. Um, my name is Kellyanne Lacante. Of course, I got so excited about talking about STEM, I think I forgot to introduce myself. And I'm going to bring up this share. There we go. And this is Starnet STEM Activity Clearinghouse. And thanks to my fabulous colleagues in the US, this has grown significantly over the last year. We're at 400 and some odd activities. Brooks and Claire, hop in and tell me the exact number if you'd like. And um, big shout out to them for all of their work as long as, alongside uh, Beatrice and Greg, um, helping us build out this collection. So hey, uh, say hello to everybody on the line here with us today. And uh, I'm gonna just give you a sense of how this might work. So you've got all of these activities. You can sort through them based on how much time you have to prepare, how much budget you have for these activities, and a lot of them are really inexpensive, easy to find materials. And other factors, you can whittle it down. So I've, I've found this version of a very classic activity of taking cardboard and bits of recycled plastic and a balloon to make a 
little car that you propel. And this is something that has been used in libraries here. There's this version here, which happens to be a, a NASA version, but there's other versions out there, um, all kind of giving you the same idea. And I'm sorry, I'm giving you the wrong um, activity. I'm going, going off with that one. Hold on that, to that thought there. We'll, we're going to start with smelly balloons first, which is our science activity. And this is the one I was mentioning that's been in use here um, in, at Edinburgh. And it is all about uh, the science of things that are very small. So this is nanoscience. And you're using balloons in order to engage customers. So the activity uh, steps you through the science of thinking about uh, how to frame it so your audience can understand that their nose is far more sensitive than the eyes or ears and can detect really small particles that we can't see. So it's a nano detector, which is a cool way to think about it. And you use this um, by um, you filling balloons. So I've got a couple examples here. So I've got a balloon here, a couple colors, and of course this is really simple and just user-friendly kind of material. And inside of these balloons, there is the um, essential oils. So I've got cinnamon here and I've got orange. And believe it or not, the essential oils can be, uh, you can detect them with your nose right through the skin of the balloon. Because that skin of the balloon is tight enough to keep the air in, but it's got enough pores in it and the, the essential oils are small enough to get through and out to, and up to your nose where your nose can detect it and your brain can interpret it. So this is a really um, um, <laughs> engaging way to get people to think about the science of things that are very small. And I want to give you a sense, while you're looking at this clearinghouse here, you can go to the, the um, open activity area and it'll bring up a full PDF on how you walk through it. There's also Spanish language resources and all sorts of other good uh, materials, thanks to um, the NYS network. And there's also, from another uh, source, Questacon, a, a science center in Australia, had a really nice, very short how-to video on how you can make these balloons. And I also wanted to show you, going a little bit further down, and hello to everyone who's joining in. It's so great to see all the names and faces, and please do keep introducing yourself and give us a clue where you're from uh, so we can all see uh, where we're coming from, both from the United Kingdom and from the United States today. So welcome. I'm just scrolling down to a little bit further down in the clearinghouse, and there's a section down here called Hints for Uses in Your Library. I had a terrific hint from Dr. Kirsty Ross the, from the University of Strathclyde, who uh, pointed me out, pointed me in the direction of this fabulous activity. And she was pointing out that if you've got the, these essential oils that you're trying to put into a balloon, if the balloon pops, wow, you've got a liquid mess everywhere. So she had a great uh, twist. She said, put the essential oils onto a cotton, piece of cotton fluff, and then you put that cotton fluff into the balloon and then blow it up. So that's what I've got in here. I've got this uh, balloon with some cotton fluff in there, and that'll keep the oil from leaking all over should this balloon pop which hopefully it won't. And um, another twist for this is uh, how, do you, how do you make this activity a little bit more engaging? And so for the University of Edinburgh, they happen to be already celebrating one of the most famous book series in time. And the, you probably all know this book and how it, there's uh, some uh, jelly beans, some tasty and some not. And uh, the mission was for the um, young witches and wizards to go look for some spilled jelly beans in the stacks of the library. So this is a really clever way to get young people using their nose to do some science in the library. Now from here, I'd love to know, if you've got some ideas on your end for how you might include um, some local connections when you're thinking about your own programs. Let me get our, my slides back up here.
Are you back to, to slides, everybody? Is that what you're seeing now? Okay, I've got a question for you all. And thanks, Brooks, for the reminder. Please do use all panelists and attendees so we can all see your comments. Excellent. Thanks, Brooks. And I wanted to, to um, just give you all a chance to talk about this. So one other connection that I encountered uh, in my travels is I had the opportunity to talk to a young entrepreneur who makes essential oils. And she was asking me, ah, STEM activities, do you have any that use essential oils? Because I have a business of selling essential oils. And this seems like this particular activity would be a wonderful connection to this young entrepreneur. So I'm wondering for you in your communities, where would you see connections? Um, are there any ideas? Have you tried anything? Would you like to try anything in making a connection with an industry or a business in your region? Any ideas out there? Oh, Julia, you are mentioning the County Conservation District. Do you tell, how would you connect with them? Do you have a particular activity or topic that you feel that would be a good collaboration point? Mm, Sonia, it's a great idea that mas a massage therapist would also have the oils and uh, might be able, might be willing perhaps to donate them for this particular activity. You really don't need very much. Um, so that could be a wonderful connection. And while you're thinking, if you're wondering where in the world that chat is, if you uh, float your mouse down, probably at the bottom of the screen, but maybe at the top of your screen, there's a chat button. If you want to just click on that and then make sure you're sending to all panelists and attendees. Mm. Oh, Sonia, that's a wonderful uh, idea to also talk about smells in the, the body. Definitely some wonderful scents out there. And Julia, you're, oh, you, you've got an, a relationship with that county conservation district presenting story times with various props for the children to experience. That sounds very fun. And it sounds like they're bringing in some um, artifacts that you wouldn't normally have around. So that uh, could be really novel for everyone. Any other ideas? Any other connections? Sometimes it, you know, there's those businesses and those industries right across the street. Is there anything that you can think of that might bring them into your library. Oh, Lauren, I love your example. Three female engineers coming in and making a structure with spaghetti and marshmallows. Very fun. Oh, Nicola, you have the aircraft industry in Northern Ireland, and you'd love to make a cart into an airplane. Oh, wonderful. And Jess, that's a great question. If anyone has explored how smells connect to memories, that's a great idea. Mm, Julia, thanks for giving us an example. Augmented sound box sounds amazing. Please do keep sharing ideas. And if other activities lead to some ideas for connections for you, please do put those in here as well. And now I'm gonna take us to the next letter here. We're gonna go on to the T which I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all have as ideas for this. But um, at the end of the day with technology, of course, we're all faced with so much new technology and how in the world are we gonna, are we gonna learn how to use this and we know it's the wave of the future and what are we all going to do? How do we help young people in particular prepare and develop the skills they'll need? And one very fundamental skill that can come out of thinking about um, computing and more broadly, computational thinking is that at the end of the day, um, giving young people a chance to say, hmm, how can I break this problem into smaller pieces and therefore solve it more readily? As a lot of, a lot of problems can be so massive and overwhelming, this is just a great life skill in terms of 
breaking something down and then walking through step by step. So I've got a couple of options for you, um, or uh, as far as um, activities. I've got one here that's called Life Science Coding that is uh, um, what I'm going to walk you through. And then I've got a link in the screen here. You're welcome to click and go check them out while I'm chatting with you all. But I'm going to show you uh, the life size coding, which is something that uh, a library here was uh, telling me how they've been using this to get the kids off the computer um, and giving them a chance to play with that idea of giving really clear instructions by having one person be a computer, so to speak, and the other person be a programmer, and then make a game of how you can have uh, that programmer give the computer in really clear step-by-step -step instructions in order to achieve a task. So give me a moment here so I can um, uh, flip over the kit to the other camera, and hopefully you'll see um, another video feed feed uh, pull up. So I'm going to be shifting to the camera under Brooks Mitchell. All right, so I have here a board with that is going to represent something that's much larger scale. And that's is going to be the uh, sort of a, a mock up of how you might use chalk outside or you might use uh, some tape, some masking tape on a carpeted floor to make this grid. And then you're going to be sent, allowing kids to be, and maybe their grown up friends um, or teenage uh, helpers, to uh, play this game with one person being the computer, so to speak, and the other being the programmer. So I need you all to help me by giving me programming inst instructions in the chat. And I am going to use this little uh, figurine here is going to be our very small shrunk down for the sake of a webinar uh, version of a, um, a computer who is going to implement your program. So just first of all, you'll need to give the, the kids a chance to think through like, wait, what, are you, what do you want me to do here? So the idea is that they are going to be giving instructions to move through the squares and that could be move forward, move backward one square, turn right, turn left, and then move um, from that direction. So it's a very simple raking down the instruction, just like you would if you were coding on the computer. This time we're off the computer and just trying to develop that really clear communication skill. So what do you all think? Um, how would I have this figurine um, head to this triangle over here? Go ahead and write in the uh, write in the uh, chat there. What would you do to get the uh, the figure there over to the triangle? Any programmers out there? Thank you, Jess. Let's try that three steps forward. So if we're going to go one square, two squares, three. I think you were saying we were starting here. So let's go over here and we've made it to that triangle. And then an instruction, introduction is just to get the kids an idea of how they can use a really limited uh, syntax in order to communicate with this computer. And you can uh, make it a little bit of a game because of course, once you've got uh, kids and a board, and they're coding each other, it can be a little bit freeform. And so uh, this particular librarian was recommending making this more of a game so that the kids really could be engaged and, you know, as they're laughing and, and just having a good time, it's all just in good fun. So one other adaptation from the particular um, a version of this, there are many, but uh, this one's from the Bay Area Museum, and they've got some fabulous resources for libraries. Um, but this particular version of the activity says, take a card and have somebody uh, draw just at random which shape they're going to go with um, on this board. So 
the uh, so you could imagine a child and a parent going through this together and the child has to pick oh we're going to go to the circle and then that the uh, programmer is delivering the instructions to get this little computer from here this triangle spot now thanks to Jess now over to the uh, circle so from here, what do you all think? How do we get our figure from this triangle over to the circle? What's your code? Uh, thank you, Nicola. Okay, so we're going to go, I suppose it's bored, you could go multiple different directions, but thanks to Nicola, we've got a good direction here of move forward three spaces and left one space. So here we're going to go one, two, three, and then over to the left. So this is um, just designed to give them that um, interaction and some sort of a mission. Now, this is, of course, really geared towards younger kids with this use of shapes. If you're working with older children and you still maybe don't have the option of having enough devices for everybody or you just want to give them a change of pace where they're not near the screen this can be really useful for older children as well but instead of having them um, with a younger ch child you might just do one step at a time and, and just deliver your code piecemeal but with older children, just like we were doing here with Nicola and Jess, delivering that code all at once so that it can be implemented. And then when it doesn't work, if something is a flaw in there, then you run through and your poor uh, computer runs into the wrong spot, but um, it has to be corrected much you le like you would going back to debug your code. I'm gonna switch back to my other camera here, for, so give me just a moment. All right, so please let me know if you can't hear me, otherwise I'll keep going. And I wanted to also give you a, a, a chance to enter into the chat a few ideas, and then I've got one more great uh, resource to share with you all. But I wanted to give you a chance to share with each other the resources that you might be using in terms of digital literacy. And so I'm wondering, as you're thinking about uh, getting your own skills up to par to be able to deliver uh, digital literacy sorts of activities. Where do you go? What's your go-to place? Do you have a favorite website? And if so, please enter that in here. And what I'm going to be doing is taking this chat and um, compiling that with some other resources that I've been collecting during my journeys through the UK here and making an online uh, resource area that can help um, everyone um, just know where to start in terms of skilling up your own um, skills so that you can facilitate. So Heather, I see you've got microbit.org, excellent resource. And in the US, certainly we're familiar with microbits as far as something that can be purchased. And in the UK, it's been wonderful that um, children uh, have received those um, in a massive push to get the technology in the hands of everyone. So there are many, many excellent resources um, because of that um, generosity from microbit. And Lauren, thank you very much um, that you're posting about uh, Scratch. Ah, I love that you've got some books. If you please do, and you when you're taking a look at um, books that that you're finding out there, please do post those on the clearinghouse. There is an area where you can post book suggestions and help us uh, share that with everyone because there's so many excellent, um, engaging uh, books, as well as post a review so that we know what you think of an activity after you've tried it. Nicola, thanks for bringing this up. So ebook creator apps. Hmm, how does one find those apps? Is that on a, is it just searching the Play Stores or how, how, do you have a favorite repository for them?
All right, well, if you're thinking, oh, thank you, different. So Nicola, you, you just go in and look and see which ones are rate, rated well and use one of those. I'm going to bring up a, another example for you all. And I wanted to give you just another repository of, um, of different resources that I've come across here in my travels. So uh, there are certainly many um, websites for you to learn coding and different kinds of block-based coding as well as uh, the codes code underneath those blocks and many great resources. Please do keep plugging in anything that you're using that you find particularly helpful for gaining your own skills in that area. And I'm gonna just bring up this area here called um, Libraries Lead with Digital. And this is a great resource and I've added one of these activities so far to our clearinghouse, thanks to permission from the author, um, looking at how would you take a scratch um, activity uh, using the a block-based coding program of Scratch um, and to implement that for a group of children so that you're uh, just some tips on how you would work through that and facilitate their experience and some sharing and use the different resources on Scratch in, in order to, to help library customers and um, this time kind of a little bit different than some of the resources out there for schools. Uh, but I want to drop the URL in here for you. Please do take a look at the other activities that are written up here. And if you are one of the authors of these activities, thank you so much for sharing your, your uh, piloting so that we can all benefit from your experience. And please do keep adding in there. And now I'm going to turn uh, back to uh, our alphabet soup here. And we're on to the letter E, which is one of my favorite uh, versions of STEM activities, because it leads to some really wonderful messages. If the kids are given a chance to um, explore things and be um, very creative, and there's no right answer, it's just uh, you've got a problem and here's a way to develop a solution. It's up to you to figure out what that solution might be and all the answers are right. Um, this is a wonderful um, sort of self-building um, experience for a lot of young people. Um, and they might be saying things to each other like, hey, don't give up, um, try again. If it didn't work and as it does, um, give it another try and see if you can uh, get that, your design to work. And there are many different challenges out there that you could put in front of a group of people um, using really inexpensive materials. And I got just one of them today um, based on, again, a recommendation from a librarian here in the UK. And that is the idea of um, taking some bits of cardboard and things and making a car uh, that is powered by uh, balloons. So I'm going to walk you through some tips that I heard from that librarian. And um, of course, the full write up uh, is on our website at the Clearinghouse. And it is a NASA version with all sorts of links to additional resources and even digging deeper into the physics behind the, um, the motion of, you know, having a, your rocket car being propelled. So it's a nice way to uh, develop this activity and make it a little bit more um, a deeper experience for say ages nine to 12 or so. And then of course, even younger children can take part in this because it is a very tactile experience. It does require some help from uh, older uh, helpers, teens or uh, adults to do uh, blowing up the balloon. And again, we're doing some more balloons here for both smelly balloons and for this activity, highly recommend having a, uh, a 
a balloon pump because I blew these all up by hand and I don't think I could do it for a whole program. <laughs> so bear with me one minute, minute while I switch over to the other camera and I'll show you some um, balloon car rocket tips. All right, so we're going to be taking a look now at the um, this close-up model here of the what a balloon car rocket base might look like. And let me give you a sense of the different pieces here. So of course, with a car, you're going to need some pretty basic parts that are going to be across all of the designs. And you can use all sorts of materials for this. In the particular write-up that I have a link to there, it's got a very long list. Certainly you don't have to assemble, assemble all of those materials. They're meant to be options so that when you're looking in your supply closet or what people can bring in from their recycling bins, uh, you've got a lot of options to put out. And when you're putting this out, and you've got a bunch of materials and a design challenge, usually there's quite a bit of chaos with uh, kids just designing and, and playing with things. But it generally, it's a very focused chaos where people are really invested in trying to make uh, their imagined design a reality and using these different pieces. So as you're putting out your array of materials, you're going to want to do a some sort of uh, base board for the car. And that might be just some bits of cardboard like this. Um, and uh, there's other options uh, that you can certainly use like a styrofoam block. Um, just something solid to put to be the, the main body of the car. Let me just show you on the underside here because this is something that um, is a really helpful tip. So on this side, we've got not only a, a cylinder here, which could be a stick or a straw, any number of things. Um, we've got that to be the axle, but there's also this piece here, which is allowing that axle to rotate freely. And this is really a helpful tip to have just some, some sort of a straw or other kind of not so much friction kind of uh, piece that you can have out for the, the kids to use. And then we've got um, many different options for wheels. These happen to be bottle caps. And then one other great tip from the librarian, if you want to make some three-dimensionality to your car here um, so that the, the kids can go creative and maybe make their own design, and um, I think this one might be ready to go for an overnight trip somewhere. It looks like a nice uh, camper, and you'll want to just make sure you're helping the kids think through how you can uh, make that stand up. And so she had the kids split where um, part of the the uh, piece is on the left and part of it is on the right and then you tape down both sides so it gives something for the body of the car and the top of the car to grip each other with of course a lot of tape and then we've got um, for the next part of it you're going to want to have a balloon and unfortunately mine deflated here while we were um, chatting but you're going to want to have that balloon um, inflated and um, and uh, using a straw. Here's where the uh, bendy kind are really ha handy. So you have that straw, and I'm so sorry my, my balloon deflated on us here, um, uh, to attach um, to the straw with again a lot of tape and using that balloon um, to be the your rocket propellant and then it's a great opportunity for kids to think about some physics as they're thinking about which way do they point their straw and um, eventually they'll come to the conclusion that um, a, a force <laughs> results in a, an equal an opposite force so they want that balloon to be expelling its air out the back so that the car goes forward and um, from here, I wanted to give you, now that's kind of like the basics of how you put it together. There's lots of great tips on the website. And I wanted to walk you through kind of like once you, how, how, how else can you set this up and give us a chance to think about some approaches for that.
So I'm going to bring up uh, uh, just kind of a nice way to think about uh, those kids and what they're experiencing in these STEM programs. And this is from research conducted by Rob Tai at the University of Virginia. He's one of our partners on a StarNet project called Project Build. And Elena, if you want to jump in and have any comments about that project, Elena is one of the, uh, our partner libraries helping us to implement that. But uh, I wanted to bring a little bit of insights from his research. So he's looking at how people learn. And in particular, he's interested in what do, what do students want to learn? And so he's done a lot of work with schools thinking about, you know, what's going to get these kids motivated? What, what do they want to do? And then feeding that back to teachers. And working with us, he's been um, working with library customers and thinking about, you know, you're in this, you're in a library setting, maybe you're with your family or an older sibling, and what is it that you want to get out of the experience? And he's broken it out into seven different categories. And I wanted to bring this up with engineering in particular, because there's, it seems like in our society, it's so easy to go to, to that competing mode of learning. And that's really something we all get a lot of practice in. And that's really helpful. Certainly, uh, we live in a competitive world. And that's, something that everyone uh, needs to have practice in. But I love that he's got these six other uh, dimensions of how we might like to learn. And you may find that uh, some segments of your community really aren't gonna be attracted to a competition kind of program, but they might love to do some of these other formats. So I wanted to give you a chance to, to uh, just have a conversation here about what do you think? Um, if you're setting up a rocket car balloon challenge, what could you have the kids do in terms of you know, these, these modes of learning? What, how would you set it up? anybody tried the rocket car challenge? Have you ever done it and set it up to be uh, a competition or uh, caretaking? Sonia, I love that. So you're bringing up an older student, helping a younger student. And um, is that something you've ever tried to do with, say, teens in your library? That's excellent. It seems like a great way to draw in those teens who like helping younger kids. So maybe they already have siblings at home and it's no problem for them to think about, yeah, sure, I'll come help. I'll come help the little kids. Jess, thank you. So you're thinking about trade skills and uh, trade skill jobs rather. That's a great idea to bring in engineers, mechanics, and carpenters to help uh, be advising, giving some tips and suggestions for everybody to, to do the do their designs. And Elena, you're thinking about a small group building something. Oh, I love this. So you're thinking about um, if you have one car that does really well, then you take that that winning car and hey, let everybody, let's see if we can make that one go even further. And Sonia, just a very practical matter. If you don't have many supplies, it's a great opportunity to collaborate, make a friend. Oh, Susan, that sounds so fun. So you're putting rockets um, on a length of string and then flying them across the library. That sounds like the control, barely controlled chaos. I love it. Mm, Lauren, that's great. And what a great point you're bringing up, that idea of teamwork and performing and redoing to make it better. Uh, certainly, uh, the two examples I've shown you here uh, didn't didn't run right the first time. Um, the wheels are pretty finicky. Um, and so that took quite a bit of time for the kids to work through and um, just kind of adjust and get them uh, 
as straight up and down as they could. And uh, the balloons are also very tricky, trying to get those, you have to use a lot of tape to get it on there. Um, so I love the idea of using string instead that can make it a little easier. One tip also from a clearinghouse reviewer on this activity was to go away from the balloons and use instead a sail and then make it a, a wind powered instead of uh, balloon powered. Ooh, Heather, that sounds like a great uh, activity. So rockets, um, using washing up liquid bottles and templates, that's great. And Brooks, thanks for that idea. Really big rocket car, oh my goodness. It might take a lot of balloons to make that one run. <laughs> Be prepared with that bike pump again. Um, Heather, if you've got a link to the activity, please do send it. And same for anyone else. If you have some activities that are okay to share um, broadly, we'd love to do a, a bounce off to your website and share the share the joy. Mm, Sonia, that's a great idea. The, the idea of just putting out a lot of recycled and craft materials and letting kids just do what they want to do. Um, there's a lot of structured time in children's lives uh, uh, and so I was just chatting with some um, of the, the um, educators here at the University of Edinburgh yesterday and they were um, talking about how frustrating it is when the kids are older and they don't really get how they can um, contribute. And um, you know, if you're asking something that's kind of unexpected, they, they don't really know how to respond. So I think just preparing them for that is really critical. You know, there's not one right answer. You just go for it. So thank you everyone for your great ideas. Please keep going with them. I'm gonna go on to our last activity here. And I'm gonna bring up a couple of mathematics activities. And um, I don't yet have these on the clearinghouse because I need your help in knowing how to, um, how to frame these. Um, this is something that's um, some great activities that fam I've seen families enjoying them, but it was at the university here. And so I've been uh, talking with the, the outreach specialists here at the university and learning about their wonderful mathematics activities and thinking about, well, how, how could we make that more broadly available and make uh, um, playful mathematics available to everyone? And so I brought a couple of ideas and I'd love your thoughts on them. And talking with those mathematicians, um, I learned that um, one of the outcomes they might hope for young people is that they do some math and they get some good practice, they might be start to thinking of things like, hmm, what if I try looking at this puzzle in a different way? So kind of flipping something in their mind to be able to solve a problem. So let me show you a couple of examples of this and I'm gonna switch over to the other camera here. So uh, be prepared for a little bit of a screen shift again here. So in this activity, uh, you're basically just given a set of um, two, two color, could be any, any kind of counter. Um, this is a, got black on one side and white on the other, but just some contrast on the same um, disks. And then there's a, a four by four grid. And the mission is to be able to flip these all over so that they make an alternating pattern but that that alternating pattern can only be achieved by flipping a square over at a time. So to give you an example, to flip, you'd have to do that whole section all together. And the art mission today is to flip these over so that we're making um, a, a, in a sort of um, every other color pattern, but we wanna do it by moving only a four by four square at a time. And we want to do that with as few moves as possible because otherwise it's not efficient. So we're going to see if we can figure this out here. So um, does anybody have an idea of where they would start? What would be your strategy if you were trying to um, go about this? First step, what would that be?
Hmm. So Sonia's got an idea. So working from the center. So we'd have to do something like this where we flip all of them over. And then if we wanted to flip another section, because we're trying to get this to be um, every other color, we would have to do some other square. We'd have to pick something else. Does anyone have another, um, another section of where they would go from here? And then one of the corners. I love the idea of thinking about the corners. So that would be flipping like this. So again, we're flipping this one back over. And hopefully, hopefully this is making a little bit of sense as we go through it. I know you don't have the disks to flip and that makes it all a little bit more challenging. But this is the idea that we're trying to go for is these um, every other pattern. We want that all the way across the board. So let me, let me give you a, a hint here from the mathematician who provided this activity, his suggestion was start here in this corner. And he's got a nice strategy for it. And of course, you're gonna have kids going through this and they're gonna be um, flipping, flipping things and then um, trying, to, trying to figure out how would they do it the, in the most efficient way possible. And your idea is to get um, something that's that's um, flipped all the way around um, in as few moves as possible. He does it in a very few moves. And all of this is online. So I wanted to also show you the video uh, or the link to the video that you can look later. But um, his, his video is going to give tips that you could present to the kids um, and hear from this man mathematician in real time. So let me post that into the um, uh, chat here in just a moment. I'm going to leave this as a mystery for you because I'd love for you to see the video. So let me bring over one activity. That's the te first teaser. And the second teaser is, is this activity here. And one of the challenges here, this of course being for much younger children, and I'm conscious of the time, so sorry, I'm gonna have to rush a little through this one. These are um, really simple um, blocks that can be purchased easy online. Um, I just Googled ladybirds and found some options for them. Um, they're very tactile, and so I'm wondering what you all think about this as um, an option to set out on a table with no, no facilitation, but just this instruction sheet, uh, courtesy of the University of Edinburgh here. And then it, the instruction sheet lays out a few challenges that I could see a parent working through with a, a young child, say um, up to about age six or so. And the idea being to take these pieces and mix them up according to the challenge. And they're pretty easy to move apart, pretty chunky for small hands. But the questions would be like this, and I'm just trying to give you a sense of how a mathematician might approach this. So how many different ladybirds could you make with all three different colors? So saying, how can you mix these up so they're all different? And can you find all of the combinations? And best of all, how do you know that you've found all of the combinations? I think that's part of the, the the really critical step for a mathematician is, can you prove that you know you have the answer? And what I wanted to, to show you as well, since these are pretty versatile, another challenge is to say, try to make a ladybird where the two pieces of the body have the same color and the head is different. So you can kind of get a sense as a, an adult pretty quickly that you've got only so many of these colors. So you've got three of these and three heads so each paired uh, combination of colors could have um, any other two colors to make it all mixed up. And see that there's, there is a way to find all the combinations and then show that, yes, I can't, I can't make any more because I can't add a yellow to this that wouldn't be mixed up enough. 
the the challenges are pretty simple and pretty um, there isn't really a wrong answer it's more to be kind of explore and see what you can figure out so for now I'm gonna just move back over to the chat and I'd love your input on what to do with these two activities in terms of you know could you see yourself leaving these uh, ladybirds out for young parent and child to perhaps work through and, and I messed up my uh, counters again here but could you see leaving this puzzle out along with a video from a mathematician giving you the answer after you've had a chance to play with it so I'm going to switch a, a, over it and I'd love for your input on the chat while I get you the link to that video So what do you all think? Any, any suggestions, ideas? What would you do with a math activity here? And all answers are okay. If you're thinking, hmm, I don't know that I could use that. Or, well, if there was an activity that did this, then I could use that. Please jump in and let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, I love, I love your honesty on that. You were totally stumped on the first activity. I can't wait till you see the video because the way it's, the solution is really very um, methodical. So Heather, that's a, uh, I love your comment here that you're thinking about using the puzzle during a, a class visit. So I'm wondering, would you get a set of um, discs and have those out so everybody could maybe work in pairs? Or would you just have one set as an example? Oh, and thanks, Brooks. Yes, Jess, I'd love your comment to go to everyone. Uh, Jess was, um, let's see. Jess is saying, I'm not a math person and so totally stumped on the first activity, <laughs> LOL. But I love it and see, can see the kids and parents working together on it. So it's a great multi-generational learning activity. Oh, Anne-Marie, it sounds like you've already got some uh, uh, regular kind of event or happening where people are coming in to play and use games and you might incorporate these as well that would be fabulous and heather great idea to work in pairs and see if you can get people to to bounce ideas off of each other especially with the counters game it's really just a matter of um manipulating a little bit um to to see like any puzzle it really makes all the difference to be able to actually touch it and turn things Well, now we're coming up on the final moments here. So I just wanted to go ahead and take us over to final uh, resources for you all. So I'm really delighted that you could join us today here for our first, intentionally anyway, international webinar on the StarNet webinar series. Delighted that you could come join us. We'd love to keep the conversation going. There is so much experience and ideas happening um, in libraries across the UK, as well as across the US and Australia. And I hope that we can all share and support each other as we do this really critical work. So check us out on social media, visit our website, and please do leave a review after you try these, uh, these activities. I will be in touch with um, math activity links on the Clearinghouse and further resources for um, developing your own digital skills as a new area on our website. So please do. Um, Please do. Yes, thank you, Julia, for, um, for your comments there. And thank you. Big shout out to, um, to Brooks and Claire and Greg, everybody back in uh, the US at StarNet. Thanks so much. 
And um, from here, I'd love for you to take a quick survey and just give me some feedback and let me know what you think about this webinar and how we can make it better in the future. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Hey, thanks, Heather. <laughs> thanks for joining us from Northern Ireland. I love it. And I'm gonna enter in that uh, survey, please, if you have a minute. Um, when I close it out, it'll redirect you as well. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody.